Welcome to A1 TV, The Mark Show. And today's guest, a bit of a different tact, a bit of a different journey, but a person you should know on the screen, you look very familiar. Daniel Jackson, or is it Dan? Or well, I call you Dan or Daniel? Only Daniel if I'm getting in trouble from my mum, so I prefer Dan. Dan Jackson, formerly from the uh, Richmond Football Club, but also now at the Adelaide Football Club. But Dan's journey is amazing. We're going to go through a whole different facets of what Dan has done in his life, because where he is today is uh, not where he started off. Just a few stats, Dan picked 53 in the 2003 draft, come from Oakley Chargers through Carey Grammar and the Richmond Football Club for 10 years through 2004 to 2014. Dan, welcome to the show. Let's explore your life as a football and also whatever you're doing now. So welcome. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the chat. So tell us a little bit about your 10 years you spent at the Tigers and coming through getting drafted. Was that for you something you always wanted to do as a young fellow to get drafted and play AFL football? Funnily enough, not really. When I was little, little, you know, every kid says, oh, I want to play AFL football. But as I got older, that wasn't the thing that, that at least I thought I was sort of leading towards. I loved playing footy with my mates, super competitive. But maybe I just didn't think I was good enough or, I don't know, it wasn't really on the radar. I was, I was a good student. I, there was a lot of things I thought I could do. I didn't know which one. And I think it's a relevant story. I used to share it a lot with, with young people when I was playing and they, when they cared to listen. I was drafted when I was 17. And so you could do that back then. So I was still at school. I was a carry grammar. I was aspiring to get good grades, go to university. But sort of long story short, the Richmond Tigers had been looking at Tom Roach. So he was going to father son for the great disco Roach. They'd seen me playing school footy with him and a bit of Oakley Chargers, but I wasn't a rep level kind. I didn't, hadn't played for Victoria. I wasn't on anyone's radar. And so they thought, oh, if we take a punt and pick this kid up a bit younger, then next year at his 18 age, we won't have to compete. So we can use a lesser draft pick. So they knocked on my door, basically spoke to my parents. And the offer was, we'd love to draft Dan as year 11. He can go to school next year. He can focus on that first and foremost, play school footy, and then still come to training when he can. And then uh, at the end of next year, come full time. So it was a pretty amazing offer. But I remember at the time, I just, I wasn't sure about whether to accept it or not, because it was, it was going to be a big commitment. And then um, as it turns out, it was an 11 year commitment because it, uh, it sort of usurped the first decade of my um, adult life. It has set me up for the journey that I then gone and had. And I'm sure we can talk through sort of the highs and the lows, probably more, definitely more lows than highs. When I look back at the journey, there, there are a lot of sort of parts where I think far out, that was a lot of work, but it all stemmed back to this decision at the start, I think, which was, do I really want to do it? If I'm going to do it, I do need to do it properly. That's sort of how it played out. 156 games in that those 10 years. Uh, and I suppose that I think before we went on air, I asked you about the man, the coaches you had and what, how they framed you, a young fellow coming in 17 years old, how they, the coaches you had and how they framed you as a person, how'd that unfold? Yeah, I think that's the thing I found hardest early days because I work in leadership and culture now and, and that's in sport. But when I was in the UK, I was doing a lot more in, in the corporate world. So I've got a reasonable understanding of the nuances between the two and the similarity. Back then, sport at the elite level, I think probably across many codes, but I can only speak to Aussie rules, it was very much about if you play footy, that's what you do. Your identity has to be football. We've got, you know, we had this perception of what the archetypical footballer is, macho, tough, no complaints gets a concussion, keeps playing, has no other interests other than maybe having beers on the weekend. And that didn't suit my personality type at all. Like I was studying a commerce degree. I spoke French, which I'd learned when I was little. I, I loved to travel. I, I loved footy in, in the sense of I loved pure competition, but it wasn't my identity. So I often felt like I didn't belong in the environment because I felt like I was a bit of a fraud. I was always trying to fit in. And Brene Brown talks about that a lot. Great environments help people feel like they belong. They don't force them to fit in. They're quite contrasting things. So I, I, not to say that that was on any specific leaders. I think that was just the culture of the industry at the time. Something I struggled with through my whole career, although the industry did get better and more aware of it. And now it's, it's completely different. I'd say we lead the way globally with that sense of building cultures where people can thrive rather than just trying to hit them with a stick and, and burn them out. So your coaches you had over the, over the time in your career, 10 years, you had, who did you have and how did they influence you as a person? Like, were they different coaches? So who were they? So Danny Frawley was only there for my first year when I was mostly at school. He was an amazing guy. And obviously he's um, passed away now, but everyone sort of knows the legacy he left with everyone he coached. He's a really positive coach. He probably, he would fit in the system now a lot better than he did back then because he was great at building confidence, building an environment that nurtured individuals' differences, but also could be quite firm in regards to driving standards. But he certainly instilled a confidence in me as a 17, 18 year old that I had the potential, which is something that I didn't necessarily have. And then I had Terry Wallace, who he had had a lot of success at the Bulldogs in the 90s. And I think he was very good in that era of 
more of that old school culture where if you get a bunch of guys who love playing footy, they're ruthless competitors. They don't care or think so much about identity and work-life balance. He would succeed. But as the game was changing, I don't know if he adapted to to that aspect of coaching. Uh, he was a brilliant tactician. I knew the X's and O's, but his man management, in my opinion, didn't suit my style. And I think that's sort of where he came undone at Richmond because we had a young group coming through and the older guys were doing well. The younger guys just didn't come on as quickly as they needed to for him to get his X's and O's to work. And then uh, there was an interim coach in between, but then Damien Hardwick. So from 2010, I was the first five years with Dimmer. And obviously we know anyone who follows AFL now knows how good of a coach he is. And he was he was probably a combination of both. He, um, very, very good tactician, but I'd say early days had a real strength with people. He would, he shared this story publicly, so he wouldn't be mind. He then went away from the people and I think got sucked back in when into what he was most comfortable with, which was more the X's and O's and the strategy. But then with the club's help, he went and re-engaged a bunch of development opportunities and learning experiences to strengthen up his people side. And as it turns out, that was actually his biggest weapon when it came to coaching. The, the, the X's and O's combined with his ability to build an environment where guys just loved to play for him and loved coming into work every day has resulted in what the Tigers have got now on field. Uh, I suppose the other thing is also, I was interested to read that uh, you're in the leadership group from 2009 to 2014. What sort of leader is Dan Jackson? Because for me, I love leadership. I'm, I love it and I, and I absorb it. And, you know, you learn from a lot of different people. So what did you bring to the table as a leader at the footy club? Yeah, I think the two things, we call them weapons and work-ons at the moment with our young Crows guys. My two weapons, leadership weapons were one, I was a hard trainer. So if I was going to be out there in training, I was going to be up the front. I was going to be working hard, at least as hard as anyone else, if not the hardest. So I prided myself on that. So that's probably that role model element when it came to the, the training side, not in all areas, mostly the fitness kinds of things. The other part is I'm, I'm a very opinionative guy. So I'd be very happy to challenge when needed. A lot of young leaders, in particular in a sports sense, don't necessarily have the confidence or the experience or the, the knowledge to know when to challenge. But I often felt very comfortable to stand up to all and sundry and give an opinion. So I was on the board at the AFL Players Association, had strong views about representing the players. So that probably the two weapons. But the work on areas for mine, and, I, and I, I've become much more aware of this now going back into a football environment because I didn't, see myself as a footballer and I was very wary of this isn't my identity I was more inclined to get in there work really hard and then get out and then it would get to the off-season period and I would just disappear overseas and I'd really disconnect from I think the biggest issue was my teammates who if I had my time again I needed that time away for my personal identity and a bit of R&R yeah. to come back refreshed for the next season but I could have been a lot better leader if I invested more in my I loved the guys I'd go for beers go for coffee but I just, I wasn't getting them around for dinner. I wasn't checking in on them on the off season. I wasn't helping teach them the things that I knew made me a reasonably successful athlete. So that's something that I think if I'd had my time again, I would have, I would have nurtured my, or mentored my younger self to develop that side of leadership. Now, isn't it really about a collective group of individuals coming together to achieve a goal? And they come from different walks of backs, different backs of uh, walks of life different backgrounds, different cultures, different, obviously, vocation, and coming together and obviously putting them together because then, as a man manager, you need to be able to know every individual, and that's really a skill set. Couldn't agree more. We spend a lot of time with our young leaders now just going through this idea of know thyself, you know, the, the Temple of Delphi in, in just north of Athens where the, the, the inscription on the, on the temple was know thyself from 3,000 years ago, and I think that is the epitome of great leadership and great leadership teams so we spent a lot of time exploring the stories of our young leaders to help them, because they're only young, help them identify those data points that tell them the story of who they are. And then from there, we can work out what their strengths and weaknesses are. So I think, yeah, when you put people into a shared leadership position, knowing who's got at what, get who's good at what, and rather expecting that everybody's good at everything is where you're going to get great success. And so I've got to present to our board next week around leadership and culture. And you know, the question will be, how are we developing the, these young leaders? What are the inputs that you're putting into place? I've been sort of reflecting on this this morning on my notebook right here, that often we start with leadership to have to create the culture. So you get someone in who's senior, they look at it as like a curator of the culture. The culture creates the environment that just naturally develops everyone. So in a footy sense, you bring in young men but they have leadership, raw leadership talents, but you've got, to, you've got to chip away all the bits and pieces. So then after a period, that culture then creates the leaders that reinforce, become the next level of curators. So talk about curators and custodians. So yes, culture starts with leadership, but in essence, if you do it well, you then get this natural development of people that thrive in your, 
environment. So it's not as much as me saying, right, these young guys are going to be our next leaders. I'll go develop them. It's let's help the senior leadership curate the culture that we want. And then these young guys will learn those behaviors a bit more organically. Talking about that, it's a really good question because got a really good lead in. Young people who come from, uh, who play AFL football today, are they more aware of leadership and culture and um, all the things, the dynamics of what you're talking about? Have they got an, more of an idea than when you first come in because there's more education around or is it because of the, the way they're brought up or just their background? How is it at this moment? Really good question. It's quite pertinent because we've been interviewing a lot of potential draft picks for uh, this upcoming draft. And so I asked them questions about their leadership experience and capabilities. And they're hyper aware of what they need to say because they've been, they watch YouTube videos. They're well trained. I, I didn't have a draft interview. No, we didn't, we didn't have YouTube to go and call back. So I would have shared experiences about being captain of the football team and how I'd had to challenge my teammates after a game or during a game, whatever it might have been. These guys can reel off a lot of the stuff that they know you want to hear. But what, what I often realize is that they're just doing that. They're reeling off the things that we want to hear and they don't actually understand what leadership is and they don't really have any, a base of experience. Well, they do, but they haven't, they haven't looked back at what that experience is. They're just throwing out the tagline. So they come into the system. I think this is a problem with young people now. They have access to all information, but they don't have the wisdom, you know, that knowledge yeah. versus wisdom kind of thing. There's the knowledge, but they don't have the wisdom to see how it applies. And so... I think they realize pretty quickly when they come in or far out, what I think I knew or what I thought I was isn't quite the case. And that's fine because that's most young people. That's the journey that they're on. But yeah, it's, it's something I've been sort of reflecting on a bit at the moment. I think, I think you're actually right. We'll come back to that because I'll talk about it. But I just want to point out a couple of things is that you were Jack Dyer medalist, the best and fairest at Richmond in 2013. And that's a, that's a pretty high honor. It's a big award to win the Richmond best and fairest. How is that season for you? And also, obviously, the injuries you carried and you, you had during a career, some of the most important or bad injuries you had. Yeah, I think the, the notable part about my BNF win was, and I don't know if the stat still stands, but... I think I was the oldest person to win it there for the are. first time. Yeah. So I was 27, which kind of said a lot, I think, about the fact how long it took me to work the game out. I, I finished second in 2009. So I was drafted 03. So my, what's that? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So my sixth year, I finished runner-up. And then in my 10th year, I won. But the, the years leading up to that, I, I, I would have, I think the most games I'd played might have been 14 or something like that. So it took me a long time. And if I was at a club that had been at the top of the ladder, I just wouldn't have lasted. We were a developing list. So I think I got a few contracts early just on potential. And again, I think it's, it's relevant because it took me a while, even though I was a hard worker, it took me a while to work out what the process, my process was to get to that top level. And that was getting my body right so I didn't get injured. It was getting my mind right. I had a lot, spent a lot of time with sports psychs, trying to work on my performance anxiety and staying calm under pressure. I had issues getting suspended because I had these, I would use, I would use um, testosterone, but I'd use adrenaline. So music, caffeine tablets to hype myself up, thinking that's what I needed to do to play well. But what I was doing, I was masking the fear and the anxiety of, of performance. And then I would go out there with, with blinkers on and tunnel vision and do something stupid under pressure. So there were so many areas to, um, to develop. And then a year after, so I won that in 2013, the end of 2014, I up and retired. I was 28, had a year left on my contract. And I mean, I can probably share that story later on, but in a sense, it sort of took me a long, slow build to get to the top of what everyone would sort of judge as your career. And then bang, it was, it was done. <laughs> it, was a, it was a different kind of a journey. Was it your choice to end it or, or was, it, was it the club's choice? No, they, they, I kind of blindsided them. I just... I think it comes back, that's why I shared that identity story at the start. I'd been doing this one thing for 11 years. I'd finished my commerce degree. I'd been involved in a number of different sort of youth mental health organizations. I'd, that The industry hadn't shifted far enough to where it is now to suit my need for autonomy and flexibility. And my number one value was curiosity. And I just felt like I was on this hamster wheel going around. And I, the industry was still treating 28-year-olds like 18-year-olds. And I just felt like every day I was coming in here having my hand held. I didn't feel like I was progressing. And I'd also watched a lot of my older teammates hold on to the bitter end because they didn't know what to do next. And I'd seen how mentally and emotionally that had, I think, really impacted them. And I thought, if I get the choice to go out on my terms, and I had a mentor that sort of helped me with this, I thought not many guys get to do that. And so I've, I've never lost a night's sleep because of that early retirement. I walked away from a pretty good contract and probably a few more years worth of footy. I mean, I, I played in the SA NFL for half a dozen games this year at 35. So I think my body would have tolerated a little bit more of it. But it allowed me to talk, look, I look back very fondly on my journey. As I said at the start, it wasn't an easy journey, but I look fondly on it because it's given me so many tools 
and, and weapons for, for life that I don't think I would have got if as a 17 year old, I'd have said, oh, I don't think I want to play Aussie rules and just said, no, I, I don't know who I would be if I hadn't have chosen that path, even though it wasn't the path I was sure I wanted to take. Who was, uh, you mentioned, because I think mentors are really important. My dad was a mentor of mine and he's not with us anymore, but he was a person I looked to for guidance and leadership. Who were the mentors, important people in your life during that period of time? I mean, we, we never stop having mentors, but were there any specific people that you thought were really important to you? I'd say, uh, yeah, there was probably three or four from that period which really helped shape who I am now and the successes I had in footy and probably post. The first one was a guy... I don't even remember how I meet people everywhere. And, you know, yeah. so says, you, you should chat them up. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, so there was one who was a school teacher and he wasn't a psychologist, but he taught psychology at school. He was head of a boarding house, at not one of my, not my old school, but I, he must, I don't know. He must've realized I was struggling with some things when I met him and, and he just checked in enough times and caught me at a really low point at one period uh, where I actually, I wasn't the kind of guy that t- t- tended to open up. And uh, I just shared with him, I had this whiteboard on my, um, inside my closet in my room that had at the time like 183 written on it and he said well what what does 183 refer to I said it's 183 more days till my contract's up and I'm leaving I've had enough he said before he said anything else he goes when when you go home tonight I need you to rub that number off he said I can promise you right now you won't get down to zero if that's the way you're approaching every day just trying to get through he said instead rub that off at the end of every day write down three little wins three good things that happened during the day instead and I thought, oh, this what a waste of time. Like This is pre pod psych yeah. um, era where now we all know that gratitude journaling is good for you. But that's what I did. And that was the first thing that made me realize there was a merit in looking in the mental side of the game. I then had all these issues. So that was one key guy. Then had all these issues with anger management on field, let's just say. And I met this guy who was an ex-Special Forces police officer. And rather than just beat me up and try and show me what a real tough guy is about, he taught me that uh, the benefit of being able to control your mind under pressure. And he introduced me to a guy that taught me meditation. So all of a sudden I became a lot more mindful on the field because I had this process to slow down. So that was probably the first two. And then the third guy, I've spent a lot of time, spent 12 months working very closely with Ben Crow. So a lot of people know Crowy now. He's from Mojo Crow. He's yeah. works with Ash Barty, Trent Cotchin, Dan, Dylan Alcott. He's everywhere. He's got his app, all that stuff. So I spent a year with him. I, I invested financially to work closely with him, but he'd been a Richmond guy, so I had a bit of a relationship beforehand. And that was all around this purpose identity. Who am I? What do I want to stand for? And that was probably the thing I think that helped me the most where I was at in my footy, going from 2012 to 2013, getting this strong sense of who I am and, and finally releasing this pressure that, you know what, I'm not a footballer. I'm someone who plays footballer, just plays football. I'm a guy that loves to learn, is very compassionate to help other people and wants to be courageous to challenge. As I said earlier, what was one of my early leadership weapons? It was that ability to challenge other people. So once I had that real sense of who I was, footy became easy. It was just a thing I did. And that's when I finally didn't get suspended anymore because I'd learned mindfulness. I was looking forward to every day because I was practicing gratitude and I had this strong sense of who I was. And yeah, 12 months later, I won the BNF. And then 12 months after that, I realized I'm in a good headspace now to walk away. And those mentors all played a big part in that. And one of the things I picked up was uh, the Jim Steins medalist in 2012 community program. So during football, you're working out who you are and what you should be doing in life. And you win a medal like the Jim Steins inaugural medal for community work. What community work were you doing at that time? Which is obviously I picked up before you travel and I'm, I'm a massive traveler and I love travel, love to travel different places, which I'll, we'll talk about in a moment. But so what was 2012 and what were you doing way back then which which obviously forced you into what you're doing today yeah it's it's i think it all fits into the story pretty consistently when you sort of paint it out in a small short conversation but i'd finished my commerce degree at melbourne maybe in 2010 and i just realized really quickly that i couldn't be someone who only had footy on the go i needed other things but the schedule was too busy to go and do work experience anywhere so I just ended up working, doing a number of, I think initially actually I started doing presentations, sharing my story around, you know, we'd call it resilience now, but the struggles I had managing the mental expectations of being a footballer, the habits. Initially it was with a guy, this guy, Hugh Van Kylenberg. It was before he'd started the resilience project, but now he's all over the country doing everything. But I went to school with Hugh. So I I just partnered up with Hugh and I'd go and share my story. And I really enjoyed talking to young people, in, in particular young boys, because I knew that they needed to hear from a guy that, they would perceive as a big, tough, macho footballer, even though I wasn't really. But I could cut through to them by sharing my vulnerabilities. So it sort of started off just with that. And then I got invited to be on the, on a, on the board of a youth mental health. Sorry, invited to be an ambassador for Headspace, a youth mental health. 
got on the board of Big Brothers, Big Sisters, which was a combination of mentoring and mental health, the AFLP. It just, it, these things I kept saying yes to kept leading to other things. And I just found them very fulfilling. You know, obviously, you don't get paid for it. I only had a little bit of time in the week, but that time was well spent because it was always in the service of other people. And that made me feel better. It wasn't that selfless. It was actually quite selfish because I'd walk away at the end of the day. I could write on my little whiteboard, you know, spoke to the class here and, and got good feedback or little Johnny wrote me a card to say how important it was to hear his story. So that, yeah, it, it was very random at the time, but now it's a big part of what I do. So it was, it was a very useful experience. Tell me about the Nepal and the base camp at Everest, because when I looked at it, I thought you volunteered Went overseas, obviously in London for five five years, I believe. And but you also went to Nepal. Tell me about base camp and how that experience unfolded. When in my off season, as I said earlier, I'd get away for as much as much of the time as I could before the next season. So when I retired, I just up and left. I, my ex girlfriend was Canadian, so I'd lived in Canada for a few years. We travelled around South America and then ended up in um, London. But my best mate had always wanted to go and do. Everest base camp, but I'd experienced altitude before at Kilimanjaro and I hated it. So I was a bit reluctant, <laughs> but we have a, a mutual friend that uh, he was a teacher by trade, but he started this organization or foundation called This World Exists and initially started in Nepal. And the idea was he was a photographer adventurer. So he would get groups of people over to Nepal to do Everest base camp or Annapurna um, circuit. He would um, take these amazing photos, have these amazing experiences. He had people on the ground to help do a lot of the logistics. But then through that whole process, the group would raise money in, in Australia and that money would then take, be taken over to Nepal. And after you'd completed your trek, you would go and help rebuild schools that were damaged during those earthquakes in 2014, 15. Yeah. So my best mate and I always wanted to go, but we felt what a great opportunity to partner up with our other mates. So we took a group over, raised money and um, did over a space camp and battled with the altitude, but then went into these poorer areas of of Nepal and, and um, spent a little bit of time digging ditches and moving bricks and, and learning about the life of people who live just with a different, completely have a different, completely different journey to, to what we did. So it's something I would love when the world opens back up again. I'd love to have an annual pilgrimage with our young Crows guys and use the community of Adelaide and football to help raise some money, take them over, take, take over other young people, you know, potentially some of the indigenous program that we, um, we're involved in, we could, we could take some guys over there and we could have this shared experience learning about other cultures because I know it would be great for their development, not just as, as, as leaders, just for their personal development as well. The five years in London, what, what did you do in London and what did, how did you work and how did you make life and, and contribute to their society over there? What did you do over in London? Yeah, so when I, I, I first immediately when I retired, moved to Canada and I, um, had, I had a commerce degree but zero experience. So I kind of got lucky. I fell in with this Australian guy who was a... Um, he was a say, strategic business consultant. He'd say a pitch consultant, but basically we'd go in and we'd help companies win business and teach them about BD. And I found it fascinating, not because I really cared so much about pitching, although I love communication or business development. What I really found interesting was going into all these different environments. So we worked with CBRE, the big commercial real estate firm, Audible, Amazon's audiobook offshoot, mum and pop furniture manufacturers, all this kind of stuff. And every time I went in there, the thing I was looking at was the leadership and, and the, in the environment, you know, the culture. And it was just that curiosity I've always had for how people and teams work. But I wasn't finding the work. You know, I didn't see myself doing it long term. I missed being around high performers. I'd spent 11 years of my life in this environment where every day you had a clear goal. And that goal was to be the best version of yourself and then to contribute to team success. So when I moved to the UK, I was sort of begrudgingly looking for normal jobs. And just to make a bit of cash while I was doing that, I lived with a few teachers at some private schools. And so they heard about the stuff I'd been doing around resilience and whatnot. So they threw me some opportunities to go and do some talks and run some workshops. And I, I was really, really enjoying that. I was back in my element, but I couldn't see myself making a huge living out of talking to school kids the rest of my life. So I found this um, Masters of Performance Psychology at the University of Edinburgh. And I thought I need to invest in my education in, in a new area if I'm going to go to the next level. So I did this Masters and uh, through just through that process, and I think through naturally just being passionate about what I do, bumped into lots of different Aussies over in London. And all of a sudden, I was working in um, all these corporate environments, helping them with culture, with well-being, with leadership, even though I really had no idea what I was doing. But what I realized is no one really knows what they're doing. They just make it up most of the time, unless you're an accountant. But that's why I couldn't do it. It's too mainstream. And so, yeah, I just had this varied experience. And even through that, I met some guys that were working in um, youth soccer programs, working with disadvantaged youth 
So all of a sudden there was a narrative I had around that because I knew high performance and I knew the mental health side of things. So I helped build a pilot program there with them. And then we thought, well, they sort of gave me insight that the football soccer world over there was so barren when it came to this stuff that we went and piloted uh, this program at Manchester City's Academy, Southampton, Crystal Palace. And right before I ended up coming back here, we were basically right on the forefront of getting the tick of approval from the English Premier League to be a service provider for all their clubs where we could have rolled in and, and so we talked about positive masculinity, resilience, high performance behaviors. They're quite simple things, but people just weren't doing it. So um, that's one of the things I wonder where it could have gone. But as we said offline before, we'll come back to Australia before COVID kicked in because I probably would have been um, sleeping on, the, on a couch somewhere. So tell me how the Adelaide Football Club role come up because the amount of study and obviously your background and your, your interest in obviously the human element of a person and how that works in. So how did the Adelaide role and how do you find yourself at Adelaide right now? The, the role is, was probably secondary initially. Like, like, like most, um, I won't say great men, probably foolish men. It was my heart that brought me back here first and foremost. So I, um, my now fiance uh, met in London. She's a doctor and was coming back here to Adelaide where she's from the finisher specialist training, she's a dermatologist. And so I spent 2019 traveling back and forth, catching up with her and just on one of the trips, someone had introduced me to Andrew Fagan, the former CEO at the Crows. And so I thought, great opportunity to meet someone of interest. Uh, we had a few beers. And then um, the Crows went through a very similar pro process to Richmond uh, in 2016. After I'd been there, but through my master's, I'd gone back and done a big research study on Richmond's culture change from 16 to where it was then at 2019. So the narrative being that they nearly fired the coach and the board nearly had a coup in 2016. The traditional way in elite sport to change culture or to change performance is just to remove all the leaders and start again. But Richmond had taken a more mature approach and said, no, hold on a minute. We have good leadership, but you know, let's lift the rug up and have a look at the floor underneath. Wow, there's lots of cracks in our foundation. Let's address those. And so Adelaide had done this big club audit of where their culture was at and identified that they did need to change leadership, which is fine. But they also had to fix up a lot of these cracks in the foundations. And one of the recommendations was they needed someone who was fully invested or, or monitoring the, the leadership and culture space because most AFL clubs had had external consultants over the years, like leading teams and whatnot. So this new role was thrust upon the new leadership, which is now Matty Nix as the coach and Adam Kelly, the director of footy. And so they had this new role. They didn't really know what it looked like because no other AFL clubs really had it. Andrew Fagan put my name forward. I went for a beer with him because that's generally how Aussie Rules Clubs work. And shared this exact story that I've shared with you this morning. And whilst I didn't really know the value I could add and they weren't sure what the role needed to be, there was enough things. So the, the professional career, which had taken, as I said, a lot of the ups and downs, I had a lot of learnings I could teach there. There's been the study part of it, gone overseas, worked with young people in high performance environments and at schools, new resilience and had worked in this leadership and culture space. So the, all the different touch points, which I've already spoken about, kind of tied it up into a bundle pretty well where they were confident that I could have the impact they needed. And, and this is part of my present presentation next week to the, to the club board. I'm 18 months in and, and how it's evolved over time from where we thought it was going to be 18 months ago. It's actually quite different because of the landscape of COVID and where the, the team is at. But I think being able to draw on all those different life experiences has enabled me to be adaptable along that along the way. And wrapping up, do you think that leadership moving forward and your experiences at elite level and working with, as you said, working with unemployed youth or, or troubled youth, that moving forward, that leadership is about always have, having awareness? Is that what you think? Is that where you're going to take it? Is that where it will go to? I think where leadership is going. So traditionally, if, if you came in as an external consultant to help, because culture and leadership, I've heard this great saying in the UK, was that leadership and culture are bedfellows. It's a very posh way of saying they sleep together. They're one and the same thing. But it, it, traditionally, you don't in an environment. And the thing I think, if you ask someone to say, I do this all the time, I've got post-it notes, I won't get them, but I ask no, kids, right. athletes, corporate people, I say, what is, what is the purpose of leadership? And people will say things like, oh, it's, it's helping people thrive. It's, it's good communication. It's empathy. It's good strategy. They'll say all the things that um, we hear that leadership goes and does, but the purpose of leadership is to take people somewhere. It's like we, we lead them. It's quite literal in, in, a, in its essence, i.e. we have to have an element of performance. And I think back in the day, leadership was just about performance. So in a footy sense, it was we have to win all the time. In a corporate sense, if we're a listed company, we have to get a return on investment for our shareholders. Then if you watch like the, if you watch The Last Dance, Michael Jordan, he was that kind of leader. Steve Jobs, that was the era where it was just performance. And we realized that didn't work. Exactly as I shared earlier, you create environments where people burn out. They don't want to be there. They can't thrive. So then we've shifted across to, well, leadership is about, we've got to create environments where people feel really good. 
that doesn't work either because ultimately we still have to perform. If, you, if you're a military leader and you lose battles, you're not going to last very long because everyone's going to be dead and you've failed. We don't go to war anymore and hopefully we won't have to. But in a corporate sense, we can continue to fail and eventually we just bring in the next leader and then hopefully they change things. I think the next part of leadership is accepting that we do have to drive performance but it's not through ruthless accountability. We can get accountability by building environments where people can thrive by caring, helping them become more self-aware and have that personal growth. And then through that empathy and, and the word love, through that love and that genuine connection that they have to you as a leader and your environment, they will be accountable. They will want to perform because they'll feel invested in it. So it's, if you just go accountability, you burn people out. You can motivate them through fear, that's fine, or reward, but that's only going to be short-lived. Or you can be, build an environment which is purpose-driven. It's got that high level of psychological safety and people are inspired to come every day and that's sustainable. So I, I think we're getting this good balance now where we accept that performance is key, but also love, care, connection is also key. And through that, we get a great unity. And it's a hard balance, but if you get it right, you'll go places. One of the key words that really resonates with me is self-awareness. Uh, it's a really big thing for me. And you know, I'm a bit of a mentor myself and to other people, but I'm always on about self, being self-aware. If you're self-aware with yourself, it's a, it's a big key. Now, I've got two, two last questions. Who's going to fl- win the flag and why? It's a good Any question. So I, grew up, I grew up in a family where my old man and his family were Melbourne supporters and my mum and her side were Bulldog supporters. And luckily, I mean, I was a West Coast supporter, so we were highly dysfunctional. I got drafted to Richmond and I unified the family because all of a sudden they were Richmond people. But I suspect they're going to have quite a bit of division. They're back in Melbourne in lockdown at the moment. So I'm quite torn because I feel like I'd have to pick a side. But if it was a few years ago, I probably would have said I'd like the Bulldogs to win because I've kind of, you know, I like an underdog story. But given Melbourne hasn't won for so long, I think, I mean, I'll be happy either way but I'd like to see Melbourne win. Who wins? I have no idea. I think it's going to be an epic game. Yeah, good stuff. And the last one is, what's the best place you've been to and travelled to and why? Just That's off the really top of your head. That's a really tough question. <laughs> I, I, I had one of my old teammates was working in Amman, Jordan, and I hadn't spent much time in the Middle East. Like I've gone all through South America, not huge parts of Africa, but a few parts, Asia and all that. Never been over there. And that was a real eye-opener, just the... the, the the difference in the, the Islamic lifestyle, you know, you've got the, the call to prayer happening all the time, um, going down to Petra and hearing the history of what it was for the, the Bedouin people living in the desert, which you just think would be inhospitable, but they made it work. And then when you're know, driving across to Israel and just seeing this conflict between Muslim and Jewish communities that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. So I think, I think that's probably been the most enlightening place. So I wouldn't say it's my best place because it depends on what lens you're looking yep. at it through, but that one there gave me a great perspective on the world. Fantastic. Jan Jackson, thanks for joining on A1 TV, The Mark Show. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's really good insight to see elite sports people doing other things outside of their own sport and you've made your career and now you're sort of thinking about life after sport and I think it's a really important thing that you're doing what you love or you're doing things in the area that you love and I think that's really good so thanks for joining me thanks Mark it's been great to chat